first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Just a, a brief report. I uh, wanted to uh, just thank again um, the folks down in the Upper Valley at Manistet Hospital. We were down there last week. Uh, we heard from their accountable community for health, which was very informative. Um, and folks on the board, what we do when we travel um, to different areas of the state is we split up in the morning. And um, Maureen and I had a nice visit at HCRS, and I have no idea what that stands for, but it's the DA in Springfield. Um, and then uh, Tom and Jess went over to Dartmouth and had a meeting with them. And um, more, uh, Robin and uh, Kevin uh, visited with Vanna Scutney. So it's nice to get out and learn more about their community. So thanks again for that. Um, and also just a scheduling note, our November schedule is posted on our website and I'd encourage folks to take a look at it. We have a, at least one day, um, an all day meeting. So just take a look at that schedule. And that's all I have to report, thank you. Thank you, Susan. And speaking of that meeting, um, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of October 31st. Is there a spooktacular motion? <laughs> so moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, October 31st without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, if Sarah Kinsler could tee the afternoon up for us. Hi all, can you hear me well? Great. Yes. Um, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, JMCB Director of Strategy and Operations. I was tasked in 2017 with staffing the board's work related to vital health information technology and health information exchange. As a reminder, the board has three major oversight activities in this area. Um, the first is to review and approve VITAL's uh, annual budget, uh, which we did in May. Um, the second is to review and approve the HIT plan, now known as the HIE plan. And the third is to review and approve annually um, the connectivity criteria that describe um, criteria for connecting and prioritizing connections to the VHI. So today we're gonna deal with these um, second and third responsibilities. So before I turn it over to Diva and Vital to do the bulk of the, the talking today, um, staff have developed a handful of principles to guide the board's review or to, to support hopefully the board's review of these um, deliverables. Um, there are four related to the HIT plan um, listed here. Um, really, we want, to, um, we want to ensure that our review is based on the statutory criteria for the HIT plan. Um, in Title 18, as well as the board's principles for healthcare reform. Um, we wanna ensure that the HIT plan, the HIE plan is consistent with, um, um, with recent legislation to support vital oversight and HIE oversight, so Act 73 and Act 187 most recently. Um, and we wanna make sure that the HIE plan is consistent um, with national best practices and that it incorporates feedback from Vermonters. In addition, we have two suggested criteria or principles um, for reviewing the connectivity criteria. The first is that it's well aligned with the HIE plan. Um, we talked about this in uh, late February when VITAL originally came to us with their annual connectivity criteria and we asked them to hold off on that so that it could be um, reviewed in the context of the HIE plan. Um, and then the second criteria is about operationalizability. So making sure that um, the criteria that we receive are clear enough that providers, VITAL, and the state can all use them um, to enhance the BHI and make sure it's working well. Um, lastly, I want to provide a quick process reminder. So we received the HIE plan and connectivity criteria on November 1st. Um, November 2nd through the 15th, there are special public comment period, so I would invite um, members of the public to visit our website to provide um, written comments specifically on the plans. The plan's also posted there. Um, on uh, November 19th, uh, I'll come back before the board and provide um, a actual staff recommendations that take into account the presentations we hear today as well as any public comment we, we receive. Um, and our hope is that we'll be able to vote on this on the 19th. Um, does the board have any questions? We do not. All right, then I will turn it over to Diva. Thank you. Do you think this time? Yeah, this up to the chair. Do you think she should start? If Emily's ready, sure. We don't so I've learned that I'm not very good at throwing my voice in this room, so I'll try to. So 
to closer. Um, I'm Emily Richards, the Director of the Health Information Program at the Department of Vermont Health Access, and I'll soon be joined with Michael Costa, who's what we call program sponsor. He's also uh, the Deputy Commissioner at EVA. <coughs> So we're here today to present Vermont's Health Information Exchange Plan, which was submitted to you on November 1st, which you all are aware is a requirement for us to do annually, um, and we're required to do a comprehensive update every five years. So we'll just uh, start with the bottom line first. Um, so over the past year, you know, we've been focusing on sort of getting ducks in a row, responding to the recommendations from the Act 73 of 2017 evaluation report that you're all familiar with and we've uh, testified to on a number of times. Uh, so, you know, a big part of that, uh, the output of the evaluation report and the work that we've done in 2018 in response was the development of a governance body to think about uh, how we get stakeholders represented and at the table and how we do strategic planning in a statewide and representative way. So this circle kind of walks us through um, from execution uh, to uh, implementation. So starting at the top right here, um, submitting an HIE plan was first um, that describes the HIE vision and promotes accountability. And we'd like to spend uh, the next hour or so walking you through uh, what we hope was the achievement of both the, the description of vision and uh, uh, the promotion of accountability. Um, in line with that, the execution of contracts and budget that reflect uh, those HIE plans and visions. And I know that uh, Vital will be back here in December to talk to you about our uh, calendar year 19 contracts. <laughs> 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 Only Michael Costa can get an applause for <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the HIE presentation. <laughs> We're just getting started, so I was just introducing this concept, uh, focusing on execution today to be ready for innovation tomorrow, and I'll let you catch your breath. Um, so Vital will be back here in December uh, to talk about their activities for 2019, uh, sort of the performance measures that we'll use and the alignment with the HIE plan in that contract. Um, we're going to continue to use the HIE Steering Committee to assess community needs, examine results, and refine a vision. So we'll talk to you about a proposed governance model bringing us into 2019 and having a fully sort of centralized or single HIE source uh, that has uh, responsibilities for statewide planning and implementation. Um, as part of that, um, they've committed to gathering input from stakeholders, existing stakeholder groups. We started that this year, but um, we plan to build out that engagement strategy uh, next year. And finally, to continuously refine medium and long-term HIE plans and visions um, and visit our tactical plan, which we'll talk about at more length today, but to give um, folks like the Green Mountain Care Board and the legislature sort of a checkbox of accountability to make sure that we're doing um, what we said we're going to do in alignment with the broader HIE strategic vision. So again, I apologize. I, I had this on my calendar for 120. I, I really hate to make the board wait, and I apologize for that. Um, I'm sure Emily's already talked about what you received in the HIE plan. Um, what you received, hopefully, is a document that does two things. It sets forth a vision for what we want, which we think has been lacking for some time in HIE, uh, and a way for policymakers and regulators to hold us accountable for the performance of that vision. Uh, we're going to go through what's inside the plan over uh, the next hour, but we do have the expectation that we're going to deliver this every year on time to you as regulators, and that this vision will become more specific and more granular over time. I think one fair criticism is that it needs to be a little more specific, and I think we're committed to doing that work in partnership with stakeholders. Uh, I want to say most importantly thank you to everybody who helped make this report uh, a reality, uh, in particular the people on the 2017 steering committee. I think uh, everyone listed on the slide on the screen right now put in a tremendous amount of time. It wasn't the type of committee where you showed up and you offered your input. Uh, there was a lot of homework between meetings as we tried to really build an HIE plan from the ground up, being focused on people and what they need and providers and what they need, not merely technology, um, with technology being a tool, not the ends in and of itself. So thank you to everybody there for their help in this project. So, oh, I got it. sure, go ahead. 
I think what we uh, also, one concern that we had was, okay, so this group of people came together, we developed use cases of how people might need HIE to empower providers and empower people. How do you make sure you're not just doing that in a vacuum? Uh, Vermont is a great place to do stakeholder engagement. And so we were very fortunate to have the following groups weigh in on drafts of this plan. Uh, by state primary care, the Vermont Medical Society, the board's primary care advisory group, which was especially lively and its feedback to us. Uh, the Medicaid Exchange Advisory Board, Vitals Board, uh, uh, the leadership of our agency, VDH staff that works with HIE every day, um, and Sarah Kinsler and folks on the team here at the board. Uh, you can always do more stakeholder engagement. We're hoping that stakeholder engagement is something that happens throughout the year as we turn this plan into a document that guides our efforts in 2019. So, um, so the steering committee, one thing that I think they did which is really valuable, but we don't talk enough about, is that they created norms for the committee's work this year and into the future. Uh, you know, I'm one of those people that believes that, you know, you are the accumulation of your habits each and every day. And I think, you know, we've had this annual obligation to offer an HIE plan for a long time, and, and that hasn't happened. And so we wanted to make sure that we were establishing a culture where that could happen in the future. And so I think the community did an excellent job of trying to create norms for how they worked and that translated into HIE needs and the HIE plan. Most importantly, we tasked the committee with demystifying health information exchange, right? If nobody knows what you're talking about, you're not going to be successful. And so we've tried very hard and hopefully we've succeeded to some extent in talking in a more thoughtful and clear way about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Uh, we really want to put people ahead of, in the health system, ahead of technology, so it's really a people-focused document. Uh, we wanted to talk about all the things that go into a successful HIE program, the fact that it's an ecosystem, it's not just one thing, and then we wanted to be able to demonstrate to policymakers and regulators and our funders at CMS uh, what does progress look like and make sure there's clear alignment between that progress and our desired outcomes. And so the way we did that is we created an initial library, as we've talked to this committee about, of use cases and talked specifically about what our HIE needs are. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were focused on delivering a timely, incredible project, and then really set the foundation for a multi-year effort for success at HIE. I, just taking a look at this program in 2017, when I started this work with Emily and the team, uh, it was very clear that we weren't three months away from value that we really had to start again and try to build for the medium and long term and hope people had uh, the patience and the persistence to have a payoff in that regard. So in pursuit of that, that um, sort of shared norm that the steering committee established to demystify health information exchange, as you notice, we start the plan, which is simple definitions, and that's so the readers on the same page about our strategic aims for the plan. So we start with health information, the administrative and clinical information created during care to support care coordination, reimbursement, reporting, et cetera. And then we move on to the verb and the noun of health information exchange, which we found even with the subject matter experts on our steering committee can really confuse the conversation. So that when we talk about the verb, we mean the action of sharing health information exchange often among healthcare facilities. And when we talk about the noun, we mean an actual, actual organization that's electronically aggregating and managing health information exchange. So we have one health information exchange in Vermont, as you know, it's operated by VITAL, and we call it the VHI throughout the plan. So as we've noted before, the plan is structured uh, in this way to focus on the basic essential elements. And as Michael noted, we, we worked um, diligently to make sure that the language was as clear as possible in explaining these complicated terms. So we start with a history of health information exchange in Vermont uh, to do kind of a 15 year look back and provide some context for where we are today. A lot has happened uh, in over a decade. 
Then we move on to establishing a framework for success, which has two important components. First, the HIE ecosystem, or the essential components required to support HIE success, and then the three tiers of HIE technology, which is our strategy to clarify a lot of misconceptions around return on investment or what we should be pursuing in terms of technical investment for HIE. We move on to governing HIE in Vermont. We offer a proposal for uh, sort of a permanent governance structure, assuming that this year's steering committee was wholly focused on strategic planning, and the next steering committee iteration will have a, a broader range of responsibilities. Um, we included uh, a look at HIE's sustainability, which is really a discussion of the need for a financing model and the considerations um, we would undertake to, to make that model. Uh, in the tactical plan, you'll see that uh, building a sustainability model as well as a technical plan roadmap are included uh, in the 2019 work, which will be demonstrated through the 2020 plan. The HIE plan also includes objectives and a tactical plan. That's to make things real and hold accountable parties accountable for what they're going to accomplish in a one-year period um, and really give the reader a focus on, you know, the milestones that we would need to meet in order to achieve sort of a visionary state. And finally, we offer some HIE planning considerations. So thinking about what will influence future planning and what we really need to focus on going forward. Okay, so starting with um, a history of HIE. So as I mentioned, this section is included to provide some context for the larger strategic plan, and we look at from 2003 to present. So we've walked the reader through um, all the way from the establishment of initial data collection registries at the Department of Health to federal policy that got us focused on um, the adoption of electronic health records and the concept of interoperability to the statewide focus and resourcing. So the HIT fund, the establishment of the HIT plan, and vital and where we have been in the last couple of years. Um, all of these highlight the important relationship between governance, financing, policy, and technology. You see that littered throughout the last 15 years um, as we've all tried to sort of mature this ecosystem, even if we weren't using that term. There's been a general understanding that all of those pillars are really essential to HIE success. Okay, so let's start now, or let's move on now to the HIE e ecosystem, which is really a focal point. And again, it's that re environment required for HIE to effectively function. And so this is based on four pillars. You know, as Michael mentioned, and we've mentioned in previous uh, testimony, the steering committee spent a great amount of time pulling together use cases or a look at uh, needs across the healthcare system. They also reflected on the national land landscape and the history here in Vermont and nationwide. And what they discerned is that there's uh, four parts of this ecosystem, first being, and this isn't in any particular order, but financing, which is a model that basically to efficiently use resources and invest in the right things that are gonna drive achievement of shared statewide HIE goals. Policy and processes are to facilitate system-wide goals. Um, you can think of the consent uh, process, or, or excuse me, consent process at VITAL as, as an example of process, and the consent policy as an example of policy, and governance, um, a formal governance body um, to support statewide planning. And then at the center here is technology. So all of these exist to support statewide goals. Without mature, maturity of each of the pillars, um, we can't assume that we can achieve any sort of HIE vision. And I, I would have to think that as the board considers, for example, Vermont's healthcare reform efforts, you know, one of the challenges is that you're not just talking about the thing itself, but all the things around it, right? And so when I think about operating a public health plan in Vermont right now, uh, you know, we think about the health of our Medicaid beneficiaries, but it, it's hard to think about having success with those beneficiaries without thinking about the blueprint for health and VCCI and the ACO and the health information exchange. And similarly here with HIE, people want to talk about the technology, but we really tried to focus about all, on all the scaffolding that has to go around that building. Do we know what we want and how are we testing that through our governance structure? What type of policies can support that ecosystem growing appropriately, like the consent policy? How should the financing work? Right now, the state has made a tremendous investment in HIE, but 
that funding needs to be renewed each and every year, which makes medium and long-term planning challenging. And so we've tried to put as much, if not more, emphasis on the scaffolding that needs to be up and successful as we have on the technology itself, and I, I'd like to think that that's a welcome change in how we think about the program. So shifting gears a little bit, and, you know, with the shared understanding now of the sort of the structure of the building, I'd like to talk a bit about the goals. So, you know, as mentioned, we talked a lot about use cases um, as an articulation of how individuals um, rely on and use health information and need, need the exchange service. So, you know, use case is kind of an abstract term. It's really just a story about someone and how they, they interact in a role and how they need something. So each use case includes the statement, as a blank, I, I want to be able to blank so that I can blank. It's a really simple articulation of, you know, for example, as a provider, I want to be able to get real-time um, ER notifications so that I know where my patients are and I can respond accordingly, something along those lines. Um, and in the use cases, they built out, you know, on the, the challenges with getting technology to support that statement um, and what an ideal state would be when, when each of those individuals was playing that individual role. So we sort of divided up the steering committee across the continu continuum of care. Uh, folks volunteered to aggregate different use cases and we came together and we assessed them um, and what came up through uh, a look at over 50 use cases is that, they, is that they could all be rolled up into three goals that really represent our vision for health information exchange. Um, so the first is to create one health record for every person. And that's pretty self-explanatory, but we're saying that it's to support optimal care delivery and coordination by ensuring access to complete and accurate health records. So this is in service of reducing provider burden by aggregating the data that people need, that providers need in one useful place. And I think useful was a term that we talked a lot about at the steering committee, um, making sure that utility of the data is reflective of um, each of the needs and providing patients with a comprehensive understanding of their health and care. In Vermont today, we don't have a specific patient portal that would show a patient their longi longitudinal health record, um, and we don't have that for providers either. So if we're talking about sort of the vision or the, you know, the kind of North Star for point of care support, uh, this is the goal. Now, when you think about sort of the purpose of health information exchange, it can often be, you know, people talk about sort of a two-pronged benefit. One is point of care support or, you know, the doctor having, or excuse me, the provider having the data they need at their fingertips to provide good quality care. And the other is to have health information so we can meet a variety of analytics needs. So the next two goals are uh, in that sec second realm of analytics, and we start with a look at practices. So the second goal here is to improve healthcare operations to enrich uh, practices with data collection to support quality improvement and reporting. So there's a few benefits. We can align data aggregation and quality efforts to support real needs, reduce the extensive burden associated with reporting, which we heard throughout. Uh, it's a, a significant number of the use cases, and allow providers to analyze their own data and put information into action. And this is happening in pockets today in Vermont. So if you think about, for example, by State Primary Care Association, they work on something called the Model for Improvement with the FQHCs. So they call together a bunch of different clinical information, put it in an analytics tool that has great, easy to understand visu visualization, and they teach practices how to use it. They say, you know, choose uh, a dimension of care or choose a patient population, and let's ask questions against how behaviors are impacting outcomes. It really puts uh, the ability to use data in the hands of providers. And so this final goal, again in line with that sort of analytics need, is a, a look at more of a population level. So using data to enable investment and policy decisions. And what we're talking about here is bolstering the health system's ability to learn and improve by using data to guide investment and inform policy making and program development. So putting data in the hands of programs serving population-wide needs and giving them population-wide data to do analysis and understand programs' impacts or plan, and enabling data-informed decision-making you know, at the legislative level, at the regulatory level. I think goals one, two, and three illustrate 
uh, what we mean when we say we want this to be more refined and specific over time. When it comes to goal number one, <coughs> we know exactly what that is. We want one record for each Vermonter. I think for two and three, the next steering committee has work to do to make those more specific and to get items in the tactical plan that are really specific about that. I think a lot about the administrative burden panel that the board hosted a little bit back. When we say in, in improve healthcare operations, what specific things can we do there to actually reduce administrative burden? So I think part of the work for the next year is to make each of these goals more refined and more specific over time. And you know, to that end, uh, in the plan, there are milestones to create um, sort of a look at what incremental progress might look like towards each goal or sort of the major um, areas that we need to hit in order to achieve each goal. Um, and I think those will need to be refined and looked at. Um, you know, we need to put some more definition around things, even a longitudinal health record um, as the HIE steering committee has more time to work together. So the three goals, they are representing sort of the highest level of vision, and then we look at um, the pillars of the ecosystem in a similar way, trying to define what each are, and then, uh, you know, each will mature, and we're assuming that each will mature um, through incremental steps. We know that we need each of those pillars, but uh, the ideal state for each is going to be unique. So we've offered what's like sort of a mini maturity model for each of the pillars of financing and governance and um, in policy and process. So this is an, oh, I'm not on the right slide. <laughs> this is an example of a, uh, the financing maturity model. So we're starting with the current state of dedicated public funds from Vermont and federal government, broadly supporting the VHI and other HIE initiatives. So as you read in the 2017 evaluation report, a significant amount of the investment that's going into HIE now is coming from the public sector. And, you know, so if we looked at what incremental progress in the development of a sort of a sustainable financing model would look like, the next step is detailed in the 20. 18-2019 uh, plan, then we've got a midterm goal and a long-term goal that looks like a sustainable public and private financing model that takes into account the appropriate ratio for each. So moving on to technology here. Technology is unique when you talk about HIE. I mean, we, you know, it's part of the scaffolding, but um, it's been such a primary focus for so long in HIE and in such a myopic way that we wanted to spend a good bit of time trying to um, shed a lot of light on each of the areas of technology that are essential for HIE success. So the steering committee started at looking at how um, nationwide we talk about the, the sort of component parts that would be needed for uh, to support any HIE goals. And they started with the Office of the National Court coordinator who has, who's the principal federal entity for uh, health information exchange. And they have something that they call the ONC stack. And it's a look at how, what the sort of foundational components of technology are, what sort of intermediary components are, and what are end user services. Um, and so we built off of that, we sort of Vermontized it, we reflected on the use cases and what we need, um, and we built something similar. So here you see a three-tiered architecture, architecture that's basically a system of standardized component parts. At the bottom, and I should say that all of these are supported by financing policy and governance. So the ultimate value to users is going to be seen in tiers two and three. You can look at end user services and say reporting services or consumer tools. Those are the interesting things that we talk about that allow us to actually use this health information, right? Um, but in order to enable um, uh, tiers two and three, we need to have those foundational services in place. So the steering committee assumed that foundational services would likely receive the greatest percentage of public investment with a mix of investment coming to the exchange services realm and the end user services sort of using a, a consumer demand model um, to be developed. 
Okay, in that same section, um, and in the vein of demystifying health information exchange and really providing some clarity around uh, HIT and HIE, um, we've broken down each of those component parts with first a look at um, sort of like an overview of the section, uh, pointing out where there's redundancies and inefficiencies, but the reality of the current state. Um, we've offered a visionary state to say, okay, this is today, but the, in the ideal world, this is where we'd be, and then articulated the key challenges for getting to that visionary state. So this is an example of consent policy and management. Um, so you know we describe that Vermont's consent to share rules require people to opt in. Um, uh, to exchange information across the VHI, then we note that the ideal state would be simple management of consent preferences to enable transfer of data, supporting a person when and where they need care. And then there's a discussion of both the challenge of managing consent preferences electronically, which is well articulated in the 2017 evaluation report, and also an issue with exchanging sensitive data types, particular substance use disorder data, um, because many electronic health records and the VHI can't separate out the sensitive data type, it's sort of an all or nothing. Either your record's included or if you have substance use disorder, it's often not. Okay. And I'm assuming you guys are gonna jump in if you have questions, so please let us know. All right, so um, moving on to the, the tactical plan or sort of like how we make this real section. Um, you know, the 2017 uh, evaluation offered us uh, a number of recommendations for how to progress forward. Um, we paired that with how we thought about those foundational exchange and end user services and our need to build the scaffolding. Um, and we built out a tactical plan that identifies who's accountable for what, why they would be doing something and the specific activity they'll be doing. So in 2018 and 2019, we're assuming that we're gonna be making some progress in um, establishing a permanent uh, governance body, uh, the HIE Steering Committee, uh, making progress on consent management, uh, and that's both, uh, there's a look at policy and uh, the technical management, data, and making progress also in data quality and identity management. The steering committee is also responsible for initiating long-term sustainable financing, uh, financial planning, so starting to build out that financial model for HIE, and developing another plan which will include the technical roadmap. So, I really wanted a checklist. You know, I, I was involved in the HIE steering plan, and I wish that when we published the report, there was actually a perforation on the side, and we could rip a checklist out where people in the state house and here at the board and inside the agency and others could simply go through what we expected to do and measure how we actually did. Right, because I think that is a key element of establishing credibility and competence in the program. And so this just gives you like an example of the checklist that's part of the tactical plan. This is a portion of the tactical plan. And it clearly lays out who's the accountable party, what the area of focus is, and then the actual activities for 2018 to 19 until uh, the agency submits uh, the next HIE plan next fall. We've tried to be as specific as we can in creating the tactical plan. So there is no question about what we intended to do during the year and we'll have a way to have a straightforward dialogue about how we've done. Um, I think, you know, it's easy to get lost in the HIE, in, in just HIE in general, and we wanted to make sure that there is some sort of touchstone for people to go back to, to say, okay, this is what they were trying to do, this is their progress so far, um, to the extent that their checking boxes off is, okay, can we ask the better question of, is anybody better off, to the extent that we're not checking boxes, why did that happen? And really simplify it for folks. And the steering committee, uh, along with the agency, is in charge of making sure that that progress happens, uh, led in part by Emily and her team, and then refining these goals as the next version of the tactical plan needs to be developed uh, for the 2019-20 HIE report. So when I first came to this work, I spent a lot of time asking folks 
what do we want? Believing that if we didn't know what we want, there was no way to be successful. Um, it would not be possible for Vital as the HIE operator to succeed if it doesn't know what its client wants. And so, you know, we also are not comfortable that the agency itself knows exactly what is needed in HIE in Vermont. And so it's imperative that we have a stakeholder group. And now that we've successfully used the stakeholder group once to develop this plan, uh, we think there needs to be a more formal uh, governance model, and we intend to implement one. And so the governance model is focused on serving the needs of HIE users. We're going to keep building and refining those use cases. Uh, we want to keep strengthening that relationship between authority and accountability and make sure we're engaging a broad range of stakeholders. You'll see in the HIE plan that other than the steering committee, we do not recommend creating new stakeholder bodies. It's our belief that there are plenty of stakeholder bodies in Vermont and we just need to utilize their wisdom and their time appropriately. And so we're going to do that. Uh, the proposed governance model we take from the research from the Office of the National Coordinator and experience in other states, and, and hopefully we'll be able to use that successfully as folks reconvene in January of 2019. Well, since previous reports have identified uh, that the stakeholder, that the lines of authority are not that clear about who is responsible for what in HIE. Uh, we're hopeful that we want to take a little time in the HIE plan to talk about roles and goals. And so we think the HIE report does a reasonably good job of trying to create clear roles and goals for Vermont's HIE governance model. And these blue boxes here just um, ask, ask some questions about where do people go to do certain things, and then what we expect of them. So we want to make sure that stakeholders know that the place you go to talk about HIE and set priorities and propose policies, the HIE Steering Committee. And that Steering Committee should develop and execute and evaluate the HIE plan and monitor that performance supported by DIVA's HIE unit. Um, we need support. Where do we go from that? We go to the stakeholder advisory groups, just like your PCAG. Uh, who's responsible for oversight? The Green Mountain Care Board, and we expect to have a continuous dialogue with you about HIE matters throughout the year, not just when the report is due. Uh, who provides HIE services? Both uh, the VHI operated by Vital, and there are other ways to use and get HIE services. Um, and then how do we hold providers accountable? Well, with the VHI, for example, we've moved from grants to a deliverables-based contract. So we're trying to make sure that we're using our contract as a tool to make sure that taxpayers get what they paid for and, and eventually get value out of the HIE. And we think by abiding by this, the roles and goals on this slides, that we can create clearer lines of authority and accountability and just have a more straightforward conversation about how HIE works here in Vermont. Now, who will be on the steering committee? I think one fair criticism of the steering committee that we've talked about in previous testimony is that it was pretty narrow. Um, we really reached out and asked folks that we know care about this work and have experience in this work and that we knew would be willing to put in the effort um, to help us get the program back on track in what was a fairly unusual situation. And the fact that we hadn't had an HIE plan approved in quite some time. I think the HIE steering committee is expected to grow in 2019 and cover more of the care continuum. Uh, if our goal is to have an integrated system of care, I think it's wise to have a stakeholder group that reflects that integrated system of care. So as you can see up on the slide, uh, we'll be taking a look. Uh, there'll be someone from the Agency of Human Services. I expect to continue on as chair of the group. Uh, folks from the Department of Health, uh, from a payer, because we particularly think that payers have been underrepresented in previous conversations about statewide HIE. A minimum of three provider representatives from the list that you see below. Uh, a person who gauges with the healthcare system. Uh, the ACO is a key strategic partner in reform, the Blueprint for Health, which has typically been a, a locus of HIE activity, and then non-voting members from the Green Mountain Care Board, the Agency of Digital Services is our technology partner, uh, Emily's team in the Health Information Exchange Unit, DIVA, and then folks from Vital as the HIE operator. Uh, we have a legitimate concern about the group getting so big that you're not able to get your work done. That's always um, the tension, right? You want a group to be inclusive. At the same time, you want it to be able to continue to do actual work that's meaningful and help guides the program. Uh, but we're excited to try this and, and see if we can maintain the same level of work and productivity that the 
most recent steering committee had. I think one other thing I would say about that steering committee is they're gonna have to work through their clear responsibilities of developing and executing the HIE plan. They're gonna have to grow and evolve based on our experience and our work and whatever technological innovations are out there in the healthcare field, because as everybody here knows, um, health information exchange and technology is not a settled field. There's a lot of development and a lot of disruption right now. Uh, we wanna make sure, most importantly, I think, that we're all in consensus about what the right investments are to make in the future. And, and to be quite frank, I think one of the most difficult things we're gonna have to do in 2019 is to take the current Health Information Technology Fund and the spending in that fund and the projects that are contemplated in that fund and ask ourselves, do these investments make the most sense? Is there any duplication here among, for example, the ACO, the Blueprint for Health, and Vermont Department of Health, and other folks in the community? And how do we get to a point where we're investing in what matters and not duplicating activity, particularly because there are federal pressures coming down the road uh, where the federal government is paying less for HIT over time, at least under current law, that we'll have to deal with? Uh, we want to make sure that that group is considering and developing and vetting policies that support our HIE goals, uh, and then engaging stakeholders in their work. We think if that group uh, ends up being a silo, that that's not a good thing for them or the HIE program generally. And so they need to help us get outside a conference room at AHS and get out into the community to figure out what folks really need and how this work and this investment could add value and make a difference. I think I also want to say thank you to Emily and her team. I think their work has changed quite a bit over the last two years and is becoming more focused on supporting the steering committee. I'm, I'm one of those people that believes that if you're gonna invite people in to be on a steering committee and you're doing it well, it requires a lot of effort on behalf of staff to properly support that group and make sure that the effort is, is worth their time invested. And so Emily and her team have, I think, a formidable challenge in making sure that steering committee is well supported in 2019. Thinking a little bit about sustainability, um, I think this one is important, but it's also a difficult one because people always want to talk about money first. That's my experience, thinking about my experience in taxation and in healthcare and, and overseeing DIVA's balance sheet. People want to talk about money first, but in HIE, I think we really want to talk about value. We want to talk about how this is helping providers and Vermonters receive better care and be better connected. Uh, that said, though, we do need to keep our eye on the ball as far as financial sustainability. And the best we've done right now is to be able to ask ourselves some very key questions. You know, will the state continue to invest in HIE? Uh, what criteria to use to evaluate our current investments and our future investments? What level of investment is actually required based on the statewide need that's articulated through these use cases? Uh, what's the appropriate balance between public and private funds? I think at least the steering committee has discussed or envisioned a future where there is a mix of public and private funds. Um, there is now in the HIE. We'd love to grow that mix, but we want to have a hypothesis about what the right balance is. And then how can we really make sure that these foundational services that we need to focus on are being properly reused? Um, I think if you think of the ONC stack, um, which I can't believe I just said the phrase ONC stack, Emily finally got to me. Um, the, the long story short about that diagram is we've spent, in my opinion, about 12 years in this program thinking about what cool things we could bring to healthcare practices. We have not spent enough time thinking about those foundational things that make this program go. And so we have to get those basics right and make sure that people are building on top of that structure in a meaningful way. And we have to think hard about that when we think about what the financial need is for this program over time. Um, and as I said before, we do have some federal challenges financially, um, just like we have state challenges financially, uh, where some of the vehicles by which the state of Vermont and other states draw down federal funds for uh, this type of work are either going away or going to be curtailed. Now, who knows what Congress is gonna do in 2020 or 2021, I do not have a crystal ball on that. Um, but we're concerned about the expiration of high-tech funds, which is where we get our 90-10 federal funding in 2021. Um, 
we, it's unclear what care coordination dollars are available. There are potentially some other federal sources of revenue for this work, but that's, it's unclear what the sort of four corners of that are. Uh, the HIT fund under current law expires annually, which requires legislative action, and so that introduces some uncertainty into the program. And then, so far, consumers do not have a financial relationship with a publicly funded VHI. Essentially, this cost has been borne by the state and a small group of VHI customers, uh, and it's going to be tricky to ask people to start paying something for something they've typically got for free. And that's, I think, why we've been trying to focus a little more on value, because until you're offering practices value or consumers value, it's hard to envision turning the light switch and asking them to pay. Um, for HIE services. So our big key future questions, which may be on your mind as well, uh, can we demonstrate that value in the HIE operator and the HIE to the system? Uh, can we, the expanded steering committee, use the HIE plan as a management tool? Um, there are plenty of plans written by state government that just serve to you know, sit up on a shelf. We're really hoping that's not the case here and that we can use this as a management tool. Uh, can we get the HIE program and the steering committee to be well aligned with our overall health system goals and avoid duplication? Again, I think those are going to be some very difficult conversations, but also necessary conversations. You know, can we figure out the right mix of revenue sources as the federal government walks back some of its financial investment in HIT? Uh, and then my personal favorite, when is the technology going to deliver on its promises? And I think that one's nearly entirely out of our control. Um, my, my personal belief is that the best thing we can do as Amazon and Google and other huge technology players run full speed into health information exchange in technology is to get this program to a point where it's very competent over a number of years, so it's poised to act and invest well as the technology shakes out in a way that's meaningful for providers. And so I think we could be really useful in thinking about what small things can technology do to reduce provider administrative burden? What small things can technology do to clean up the data that's out there on Vermonters? How do we use health information data to support decision making for payers and accountable care organizations in the state? And if we start to get that health system focus starts to pay dividends, we'll be in a really good position when the technology starts to sort itself out, because it, it doesn't appear to be at that level of development quite yet. And with that, um, we're grateful for all the time we've spent in front of the board over the last year talking about this, uh, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Michael and Emily. Um, questions or comments from the board? <coughs> Go ahead, Tom. <coughs> Well, thank you for this. I um, am near the ending of my first year here, and this is a much uh, uh, better exposure to HIE than um, when I first started about a year ago in the uh, High Tech Solutions uh, report was uh, the material that we're, that we're having to read. Um, I'm kind of looking at um, slides 13 and 14. And I'm, I'm trying to kind of sort out in my mind uh, the timeline that might be involved in, say, getting from the current state to the midterm goal. I, I do think once you get to the midterm goal, uh, the final stage seems pretty clear in sight. So getting to that midterm goal um, is certainly um, the better part of the challenge. And then as you move up the building blocks of success from foundational <coughs> services to exchange services, um, in my mind I'm thinking maybe we're talking three to four years down the road. Um, and in that timeline, hypothetical as it is, uh, I'm wondering about the turnover of the steering committee. Um, mm -hmm. This is, a, I think, a solidly crafted vision. Um, but it's also a vision that has a lot of cat herding in it. It's not hierarchical. It is um, a process that engages a lot of people from a lot of different perspectives. And so as a regulator, um, um, I would hope to be able to look out in the landscape at the steering committee and see stability there that um, uh, offers up kind of a constant drumbeat and um, uh, to uh, keep us on track, quite frankly. 
So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about timeline and um, uh, the, uh, the structure of the steering committee in terms of sustaining it on a uh, stable basis and, and you know, without, without a lot of turnover in its membership. So on timeline, I want to make sure that people understand that this is my speculation and not a, you know, a policy pronouncement. But I will tell you that when I've thought about this, Board Member Pelham, I keep thinking about the confluence of our 1115 Medicaid waiver and the all-pair model, uh, which inspire in 2021 and 2022, respectively, and think that our long-term vision here probably dovetails with the next iteration of those agreements. So you are thinking three to five years out towards 2022, 2023. And that gives you time to say, okay, we're competent to run this program. Vital is competent to run the HAE. Uh, we're credible in being able to deliver on the value and the tasks inside the plan. And given that culture we've created, um, now we're ready to think, we're now ready to get to our long-term vision and figure out what the next version of HIE is in Vermont. So that's just my thinking on it. I think um, you're 100% right that consistency will be very important in this. You just have to do the work on this, and I think it's hard with a rotating cast of characters to do that, both from a management perspective and a steering committee perspective. Uh, I think for us, the expectation we're trying to set for the incoming steering committee members is one, this is gonna be real work. It's just not just showing up to keep tabs on the program. And two, it's a multi-year commitment. Um, and I think that also means that the team that supports this has to be really good about identifying people during the outreach that could plausibly get on the board so that when you do onboard someone, it's not totally new to them, right? That they've, yep, I know you guys exist. I know this is the table people come to to have this conversation. I generally know what you're trying to accomplish and you can plug people in. And so I think we just need to continue to build that ecosystem and community of people that understand about it, care about it, and can continue to work on it. Could um, the non-voting members, for example, be kind of viewed as a minor league to the major leagues? And so as time goes on that you're cultivating people into the steering committee um, in a way that if vacancy should occur, um, you've got a backup bench? Well, I, 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 we haven't looked at it that way. I would say that the, the meetings are open, of course, and that we'd encourage anybody who wants to come to be there. The non-voting members are really, in my mind, technical advisors. There's someone from the board, there's someone from Emily's team, there's someone from Vital as an HAE operator. So it's more they're there to ensure alignment and technical assistance rather than serving as a, a minor league. But I, it, it is a, a concept worth considering and we'll take it back and think about whether we could set up something that led to that kind of pipeline for people to be effective HAE steering committee members. And in terms of the Green Mountain Care Board, would do you envision the steering committee and its reports and updates coming to us and saying, not just approving iterations of this plan, but, but, but saying, here are some specific things that you can do in the hospital budget process. I, I know it, I think it was Jess in the, in the hospital budget process kind of emphasized the point of consent and urging uh, in our decisions that hospitals uh, engage with vital um, in a stronger way in terms of consent. Would you see that kind of demand on us as appropriate? I would say, I want to be very respectful of the hospital budget process because I don't want to wander into something I don't know as well as the board. Um, but I would say that I can imagine a situation where the steering committee is making common sense uh, recommendations about how to better integrate the system. And I'll use a DIVA example because it's, it's our shop. I could imagine a point in the future where the HAE steering committee says, if you really want providers to be engaged in this, and you want to create incentives to have them involved, you need to, we recommend that you change your Medicaid provider agreement to reflect certain expectations about health information exchange. To me, that would seem fairly inbound. Um, and so I, I think it's fair to analogize to the hospital budgeting process, but we'd want to make sure that the steering committee was being really thoughtful as not to, you know, wander into an area that they don't understand quite as well. So. And finally, one, oh, just one more. What happens if uh, the legislature, when you have a final resolution with them on consent, uh, is not 
uh, go, goes against um, the um, opt-in, um, uh, the opt-out proposal. Um, it's so foundational that if if at some point we're we're standing in the hall of the, of, of the state house and the legislature has acted, and it's not uh, in, in a manner that promotes the HIE plan rather to consent, that seems to be a, a pretty fundamental, uh, uh, you know. Um, problem, I would think. I, I would approach that situation the way I'm trying to approach many other things in the HAE program, which is to ask myself two questions. One, what does success look like? And, and two, um, is the financial investment worth it? I think that without serious reconsideration of the consent policy, what success looks like is different, and, and whether the investment is worth it is potentially different. And so I think we'd be back in front of you and inside the agency taking a very hard look at this program and about whether success looks the way we want it to look and whether the, the use of taxpayer dollars is appropriate. Um, and, and I think I'm happy that the HIE program has got to the point where I think we can be credible in having that type of discussion. Because uh, it's it's a really serious thing to consider if we're going to continue to go down this road on HIE, um, and we're we'll be back here to talk to this board about the consent report quite soon, and we'll be ready to talk about it in January with the legislature. Thank you. Robin? Thank you. Uh, I thought your report was very well written and clear, so I wanted to say thank you for that. Welcome. Um, Kind of in, on a similar theme to Tom, um, in thinking about uh, both maturity and uh, really accountability and oversight, I'm, I would encourage, I guess it's really given your answer to Tom's question around making recommendations on other processes, I would encourage you to, to think a little more outside of the box than I think some of the at least initial uh, graphics in the report at least imply to me. So an example of that would be on page 19 uh, where you have the clear roles and goals uh, because as you said so much of this ecosystem is outside of state government and and uh, quite frankly to me what's even more foundational underneath your foundational components of HIE is the electronic medical record mm -hmm. itself or other mechanism for making the data electronic. And I think a lot of the challenges at the HIE level stem from the fact that, uh, that the EMR technology isn't really ready to fully exchange data, that there are too many different electronic medical records with too many different standards, um, and that that makes your foundational uh, components all that much more complicated. So I, I would be, I would my some feedback would be I would I would hope that the steering committee is also thinking about um, if there are other ways to impact that. And when we get to the connectivity criteria, um, one of the areas that I wanted to discuss related to that was that we use that connectivity criteria when we consider uh, certificates of need for health information technology investments that are, meet the CON criteria. Now those are large investments and it doesn't hit all EMRs obviously, but uh, that sort of key use of those criteria wasn't mentioned anywhere in the HIE plan or in the connectivity criteria materials. And to me that's another clear uh, both oversight and accountability component um, that could be used in furthering the goals. Mm -hmm. So um, that wasn't really a question, it was more just some feedback, I guess, in terms of um, I would encourage you to try and think more broadly outside of your immediate scope of your contracts with VITAL, um, particularly around both the oversight and the accountability. Uh, and thank you for the feedback. Um, I entirely agree, I think there are two Two things to be equally true. Um, there are two pieces that are missing from the report that are incredibly important to this endeavor, yet also feel like boiling the ocean. Mm -hmm. One of them is the relationship of electronic medical records. Mm -hmm. The other is just basic health literacy, mm -hmm. right? It feels like if those were two things we were gonna tackle with this report, boy, we're, we're in for 
uh, we're probably not going to be successful. However, what I like and what I think is necessary in 2019, to your comment, is that now that the HAE plan and the steering committee have sort of an orientation to the field, it needs to develop its view on how does this program work relative to the real world with electronic medical records, and what, if anything, can it do or have to adjust to given basic health literacy problems. Right, because there's another, just an interest of mine is um, patient registries, right? When I, I, I have a couple healthcare conditions, I would love more information about specific Vermonters with asthma, right? And that, to me, I, the, my own personal opinion is that there's a future of healthcare that's probably five or 10 years off that does a lot of that. And so I think that now that we have an, uh, the program in better shape, we need to figure out our orientation towards those two issues. Uh, as far as the cri connectivity criteria, I would just say that's a matter of ongoing discussion between VITAL and the state. Uh, it's certainly figured into our contract negotiations with VITAL. To the extent it's not reflected in the report, uh, point well taken, uh, but over time, we think these things are gonna come together. Great, I think that I would add there is, you know, I. I'm grateful that um, stakeholders have bought into this concept that we needed to clarify a lot in HIE and set expectations and build some foundational understanding, but I think we're really well aware, to your point, of the need for more granular, targeted, you know, discussion in, in the, this coming year. Yeah, and just to be clear, I think it was a, a really appropriate time to kind of take a step back and, and redo the foundational uh, vision and goals and really trying to lay it all out in a simple way. Because I think you're right that HIE and HIT all gets lumped into this big category of things uh, that are difficult to understand. So I, I think you did a great job of, of laying that out. And your point's a really good one, so thank you. I just had one question on the makeup of the steering committee. Um, when you talk about the provider representatives, what type of functions were you thinking those representatives would, would come from? Do you mean functions like as in roles on Well, the yeah, table? what I'm thinking is you probably need to have, you know, some technical, like real technical expertise. So whether you have like, you know, some chief information officers in there, you know, it, it seems that um, a lot of the committee may be people who are, you know, the end users of it and not necessarily the ones who are actually going to have to be managing that. So I would just kind of caution to, to say, you know, how are you going to guide that when you pick representatives? So I think it's fair to say that ooh, it's very hard on a steering committee or in any job to find one person who can do everything, particularly in healthcare. I think one expectation we want to set is that whomever is in those representative spots, they don't need to know the answer, but they know, need to know where to find the answer. Um, and so, for example, we have a very good partnership with Bi-State Primary Care. We don't expect their team to be able to answer every question we have about health centers and primary care in Vermont, but we do try to hold them accountable for providing us with an informed view about how, for example, chief technology officers in their group of folks um, view this. And so I think we're looking more at that, people who can who have the type of relationships where, you know, if there's one meeting that really focuses on a CTO's view of the world, that we can understand their view and get them in there for that, rather than finding one person who's going to be able to do all that work. I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's how no, we're thinking it does, about I it. Think. Okay, thanks. I don't really have anything to add. Some of my questions were already answered. I just want to thank you. The report was incredibly thoughtful and well-organized, and the presentation was great, so I feel like I have a great understanding of this, so thank you. Thank you. So I don't have any questions either. I'll, I'll, my only comment would be that I was there in 2006 when this whole thing uh, began. Actually, it began before that with Greg in the back room at uh, Boz. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, certainly we thought we would be much further ahead than we are today. And I'm hoping that whoever is sitting in these seats 12 years from now isn't saying the same thing. So, again, thank you for an excellent job on the report. And, uh, are you going to be sticking around? For a bit, yes. Okay, good. So we'll ask uh, Mike and Christina to thank you. Come forward.
Whenever you're ready, Mike. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you uh, for allowing us to present our material today. To my right is Christina Shirkat. I'm Mike Smith uh, from Vital. I thank you for the, as I said, I thank you for the opportunity to present the connectivity criteria today for your approval. As you know, we've been focused on data quality as well as data accessibility in the last few months. And as I mentioned the last time, I, we have seen a lot of progress in both of those areas. But we should, and it's required that it's a never-ending process to continue to improve upon what we do. So there is always more to do. And one of those things to do is to improve data collection and quality at the source and throughout the network and certainly connect connectivity criteria is an integral part of that improvement so if I if you don't mind I'll let Christina uh, take it from here and walk through the criteria Good afternoon, thank you again for having us. And I will. So, um, Sarah and Emily actually set um, up this first slide for me, so I'm, I'm not going to go through it in, in detail. What I would like to do is maybe focus on the uh, last two bullets about uh, the connectivity criteria, establishing that connection to the VHI and why, why we're here today. Uh, the, the current criteria is outdated and we do need to keep up with the times and at the same time make sure that it dovetails nicely and is integrated um, um, as called for in Act 187 with the HIE plan, and, and I believe that um, we have done that with this new criteria. When I say that it's outdated, uh, even though it was established in 2014, if you take a look at the initial criteria, the very first stage, uh, laid out that organizations had to either be using Vital Access, which is the provider portal, or Vital Direct, which is the secure messaging system. And in this day and age, there are other avenues to access data. And, and you may recall the last time I was here, I was talking about uh, cross-community access, which is a way for organizations using their own e EHR, to leverage that EHR and access the data and see it right within their, their own electronic health record. So it's a bit outdated and we need it to update. So let me just give you a, a little bit of an idea of what happened in this evolution. Um, the, so again, the original criteria was uh, established in 2014, um, and the revised criteria it was not just vital reaching out to a few organizations. We worked very closely with uh, the DEBA connectivity team um, as well as the HIE steering committee, the uh, certain healthcare organizations that we uh, have a close relationship with and provide feedback. Uh, we also worked with uh, the bi-state organization um, and you know many stakeholders, Blueprint, um, even if a certain member was not on the HIE steering committee, for example, a technical resource at the Blueprint was, was engaged so that we had uh, good feedback from all to help with this revision. Uh, the, again, the VHI um, connectivity criteria in the beginning was very VHI focused. I walked you through one of the outdated uh, criteria. Um, and it was more about how can a customer use the VHI. And what we wanted to do uh, with DIVA and the HIE steering committee's help is really identify how can the customers and stakeholders really be central to all of this and allow them to measure their technical capability but really keep an eye on the quality of data 
in allowing them to understand the uses of the data, the benefit of using the VHI connectivity criteria, and really encourage them to um, embrace the connectivity criteria and the VHI. The original criteria has three categories and four stages. May not have been very complicated, but when you look at it, if you're a healthcare organization, it may, especially if you're not very technical in nature, it, it might have um, put some people off in the fact that, oh, I must be technical in order to understand the criteria. And we really wanted to make it very simple um, and something that allows organizations to understand understand it very quick, uh, quickly. So it changed to three tiers and shows how organizations can advance through that criteria and become more sophisticated and more engaged with their, uh, with their VHI. Lastly, um, the customers and stakeholders may not, by reading the initial connectivity criteria, may not have been apparent as to what those benefits were in using it, um, and they didn't really quite know how to adopt it. Um, even, even if they understood what some of the technical jargon meant, and if you look at it, we mentioned XEA, XEPD, XDS.B, I know what those things mean, but an organization, especially if you're a practice manager or a COO at an organization, you won't know the technical portions. So how would you even embrace and adopt this criteria? So we wanted to make it easy to understand and again, allow them to um, understand what is, their own, what is their role and responsibility in using the criteria, using um, words that would make sense to them and not technical jargon, understand what the objectives are in even meeting the criteria, and have them understand once they are contributing data to the VHI, how can they use it, and how can uh, health reform programs that they participate in use their data. Then lastly, this is, this is truly new. Um, the criteria itself, which you have a copy of, which shows you the three tiers. We've incorporated worksheets or assessment tools within the criteria, and, and that was a very purposeful approach. The criteria we would expect to not change very often, um, just to keep up with the times. So where there are specific areas to collect data um, based upon the use cases that Emily was talking about, uh, Emily and Michael, in the HIE plan, like what are the new uses that are being um, gathered and going through the HIE steering committee, we want to make sure that we have worksheets that allow for that type of uh, uh, dynamic change in capturing data and sharing that information with organizations. So that's, that's new. Any questions before I move on? So on this slide, uh, just to point out, again, it's a really simple um, uh, uh, advancement through the criteria. So tier one is the baseline connectivity, um, and it's your first measure to be able to say whether or not a healthcare organization or customer, as we've called them in the criteria, are even able to connect. Can they and should they connect? We want to be really focused on the investments that, that's being made in selecting organizations, engaging them in this process, and spending the money to actually make the connection. So we want to establish that baseline. And um, we use something called the baseline connectivity uh, criteria that is called out in the connectivity criteria. In the past, you may recall 
I was here maybe about a year ago talking about um, the VHI interface connectivity criteria. It was called the VIC back then. It was the first iteration of what we are now calling the baseline connectivity criteria. And it's the first worksheet that um, is now in full use where we work with the organizations, score the organization, whether or not they're able to technically connect and whether or not they support robust patient matching. And then we create notes for them where we see opportunities for them to um, advance to the next stage. So that's already in use. Tier two gets to what are some of the common data elements that we know the uh, programs and our customers want to see a comprehensive data set across all that we know organizations are able to contribute. It's not a, a, a heavy lift, but those are data elements that help progress to reporting on population health um, and those types of payment reform for reform programs. And then tier three is again an expansion upon tier two. They are um, data elements or data sets that are very specific to stakeholders. For example, the blueprint for health might have social history information that they need to collect and One Care Vermont may have a different set that they would be looking at. So it allows for those differences. And again, this is the advancement to get to really a more comprehensive uh, data set that meets all of the stakeholder needs. So this slide, um, let me just orient you to it. So again, on the left, we have our advancement through the stages. And then on the right is the table, and I'm actually going to walk you through it from the bottom up, um, from tier one up. So on the left, we have um, what is the criteria? Um, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve? What's the objective once you um, are able to use that uh, tier in the connectivity criteria, and really what is the value um, in, in meeting that criteria. So I've already stated tier one is really about patient matching. We do not want to connect an organization if they are unable to allow us to match. Um, the last time I was here, I gave you an update on what we've been doing in, in order to improve um, the patient matching and deduplicating records. We want to make sure that organizations are sending good data so we're not um, uh, needing to continue to clean up. We know that we're getting good data for matching. And then the data is structured and um, able to be transmitted. And by that we mean for a message that is sent to the VHI, there are standards, HL7 standards, and we have specifications. We work with the healthcare organization and their vendor to say, here's what you need to do just to be able for us to even receive a message that's carrying data. And that allows us to say, we are now able able to also send that data in that structured way downstream. So from there, once the organization can meet the criteria, we will implement those um, interfaces and we will do the patient matching and that data is now available for use at point of care and that's the value side. The clinicians can actually view the data within the vital access provider portal or again through cross community access being able to retrieve information from the VHI directly from an EHR. Providers can see that data and use it at point of care. It also supports the electronic results delivery, meaning laboratory radiology and trans transcribes reports can be delivered to electronic health records for viewing right integrated in that EHR by providers. And again, patients are properly matched, so um, the provider is looking at the right record for the the right patient. 
So moving up, tier two gets back to what is a core data set that throughout the state we want to make sure healthcare organizations are able to provide through that interface and that the data is standardized. Meaning, if you are sending, I'm always going to use hemoglobin A1C, it just always seems to be the data element I, I select. If you're sending a hemoglobin A1C, are we able to recognize, and especially if we send that data on, that it is a hemoglobin A1C? Um, so it needs to have a standardized code set assigned to it, and we can work with the healthcare organization and the vendor to do that. Um, the objective is we want to get uniform data. It would be great if all practices and hospitals are sending hemoglobin A1C. It allows us to be able to, um, not us specifically the VHI, but the stakeholders to be able to measure that type of um, diagnostic uh, uh, result throughout the state for all of their, their patients that they're trying to manage in their populations. Um, then the data can be used beyond the point of care, again, within the um, analytic systems for the stakeholders blueprint, One Care Vermont, the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, whoever we are supplying data to. Then moving up to uh, the tier three, this is again uh, maybe specific to uh, certain health reform programs or uh, uh, or uses use cases. So, what are those expanded data sets? Like I said, maybe some social history that's needed by a specific uh, reporting system, and they will be engaged in this effort uh, along with Vital when we're working with the organization. And again, making sure that that data is standardized when we're getting more data data, we should always be able to understand what that data element is. And then we can aggregate that data. That data can be now analyzed across all organizations and um, really allows for expanded use of the data. For example, um, one of the values would be um, to uh, provide de-identified data for research purposes or being able to um, uh, get enough data to be able to um, identify should there be some policy changes or where do we want to go as a state? So before I move on, that was the quick walkthrough. Any questions? Okay. So, um, as you can tell, the connectivity criteria is all about data quality and uh, Right now, we are more focused on the baseline connectivity, making sure that organizations that are currently connecting are able to meet tier one, making sure that they are capable and should be connecting, and again, that um, the patient data is robust. So calendar year 19 and beyond really needs to focus on tier two and tier three, and this is where DIVA and the HIE steering committee as well as those uh, customers that we've spoken to have been very helpful in this area. Um, focusing on that one common data set, identifying what that data set is, and those worksheets that um, we're going to be using to communicate to the healthcare organizations and scoring them on, um, that's just about ready, so the criteria is in front of you and the worksheet is just about finalized. Um, and then again, tier three consisting of uh, an expanded data set, but that's all within the worksheet that I will be submitting to you when it is finalized. Give us an example of a specific stakeholder. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So a stakeholder could be the blueprint for health because they are receiving the data. It could be One Care Vermont. It could be the uh, Vermont Chronic Care Initiative. It could also be an event notification system. So a stakeholder to me are those types of programs or systems that are using the data, uh, downstream or upstream. I never know which one <laughs> to use. Um, whereas a customer would be those who are actually contributing the data, and that would be a healthcare organization. Does that answer your question? Well, it's a start. If you could take it to the next level, because 
Let's let's stay let's stay with the blueprint for example. Sure. Um, what would the type of data that's specific only to them be that would be provided under tier three? Um, I don't. Mm, I have to stop and think for a minute. Um, so they they could possibly be looking for. Um, some different social history information. Um, they could be looking for uh, uh, a substance abuse evaluation um, is the, and I'm not really quite sure if this is a perfect example, but I'm going to use it at this moment in time. I'll know more when I see the final worksheet. Um, they could, it could get down to, um, you know, do you have three or more glasses of alcohol, you know, every day, and there's a specific evaluation that they use. Um, they don't seem to be as focused right now on medications, whereas One Care Vermont might be more focused on what's in the medication list. So that would be um, an example. Probably not a perfect example, but it's, it's just what I can supply off the top of my head. Again, when I have the finalized worksheet, you'll be able to see what those differences are. Okay. So the calendar year 19 contract that VITAL has with DIVA plus the connectivity criteria will be the tactical effort in order to really drive the data quality. And I'll walk you through uh, what, how we would actually put this into action. That's probably the more exciting part of the connectivity criteria, right? So um, using the connectivity criteria, we would use that to assess the site in determining Again, are you able to meet tier one? Can you meet the specifications and technically connect? And are you sending um, good, robust patient demographic data to ensure that we are matching? And um, we'll also look at a, a, a data quality analysis using the tier two and three worksheet. Can you send that common data set that the state would like to be able to ensure that you your document and, and sending to the VHI, again, using hemoglobin A1Cs, like those type of diagnostic tests, uh, problems that are being um, reviewed across the state, whether it be diabetes, uh, coronary artery disease, um, hypertension, those types of things. And then we will um, put together a work plan with the organization and their vendor to implement those interfaces and continue to work with them to send that good quality data. And by good quality data, what I mean is, again, the ability to recognize that they are sending the data element um, or data set that we would be looking for versus the accuracy of that data uh, typically a diagnostic result, the, the value of that result is whatever the, um, the lab produced or whatever the provider documented. Um, and then we would implement the interfaces, have the, or you'd go through that uh, connection and testing, as well as get an attestation from the organization at the end of the implementation that we're all on the same page. It has been implemented, um, and we've implemented that work plan for tier two. Tier three would be by incorporating the blueprint and One Care Vermont to make sure that they're also at the table to, uh, to collect the data that may be specific to their program. Any questions? Well, on tier two, yeah. uh, it seems like uh, with so much of the state moving towards the EPIC system that there could be more commonality than what currently exists, especially if they figure out so that Dartmouth and the UVM system are talking to each other. So I'm curious, um, what role has VITAL played up to this point? Have, have people implementing the EPIC system at UVM reached out and had thorough discussions with you? or? So we've worked with UVM and, and 
tell me if this answers your question or not. So we have worked with UVM because we're currently um, actually collecting data from them, and they went through a similar process to make sure that the EPIC system at their uh, instance, their implementation, was actually sending the right, um, the right structure of their message we were able to work with them to say, what are you documenting and are we getting those data elements within the system? So we've done that work with UVM already. Um, we will be working with them at the, um, at the time that they're implementing within Porter to do that retesting now that they've done in, uh, an implementation at additional um, organizations. That's Porter and CVMC, I believe, are, are where they're expanding. Does that answer your question? Or did you kind of, but say, say that I'm uh, uh, a little bit yeah. which I do, and uh, my records are probably with my local doctor and probably at uh, our RMC with CERNA. Under tier two, is there going to be all that, to be that communication so that if I'm up in uh, UVM and somebody's crazy enough to convince me to go jogging <laughs> and I fall and get hurt, <laughs> Um, that they're going to be able to access my information? Yeah, so now you're on the access side of the house, which is why um, the data quality is important, because we want to make sure that, um, and we hope this doesn't happen to you, but should you be jogging and fall and you end up at UVM, that um, they're able to access your record right within their EHR and see a comprehensive set of data um, Again, not to say that we hope this happens, but you know, say you were jogging and you hit your head and, and you were unconscious. We would want to have the provider be able to access your health record with good quality data. Again, a comprehensive set of data to find out, are you allergic to anything? What medications are you on? Um, and be able to care for you appropriately. So yes, through cross-community access, that would be um, directly from the EHR to be able to pull the data and see that good quality data. Um, or for those who might have an EHR or not have an EHR at all, be able to use Vital Access, which is that log on to the provider portal. It's the product that we offer. Does that answer answer yes. your question? Yeah. And UVM, as you may recall, they're the first organization that we are working with for this cross-community access. And we um, are looking to expand that uh, across the state. We're also using something called single sign-on, which is, uh, and Northeastern um, Vermont Regional Hospitals is, is using this technology uh, right within their EHR. They press a button and it brings them into to the provider portal. It is still the provider portal view, but to the provider, it's seamless. They just press a button and, and there it is. It would be able to locate your record and present it for the provider to view. Does that help? Yep. Okay. So I had a, a question as well and follow up. Um, it, in terms of what really the EHR market has out there right yeah. now, are yeah. there EHRs that providers that can get that wouldn't satisfy all three tiers? Because it seems like the tiered approach is about improving uh, the quality of the data and the types of data that's exchanged. Mm -hmm. But I, from a technology perspective, are there uh, choices that really wouldn't meet all three? Um, so we've been working with the uh, electronic health records that are probably the more advanced health records at the moment. There are um, the hospitals and primary care, and because of certified EHR um, requirements, they have those the, that technology to be able to meet more, well, obviously, tier one um, and tier two. Um, we still do have some vendors who should be able Able to connect that we struggle with. Um, one is eClinical Works. We've put into place um, a file extract just
just recently um, with a couple of the practices to be able to extract the data in a non-standard way, um, but still in, in a way that supports tier one and tier two. I do expect that there, as we expand um, across the state, that we will identify um, EHRs that are maybe only at tier one and not at tier two, which is why the work plan is very important. We want to make sure that the organizations that are paying their vendors, in my opinion, very good money, um, that they are able to say to their EHR vendor, this is what we need to do in order to support interoperability, to participate within a health reform program, um, and we are uh, requiring you to help get us to tier two and then tier three. But we're actually putting in place a work plan with the organization that they can speak to. Because right now I think they struggle with what it is that they need to share with their vendor. And this is in written format. It's very clear they can hand it off um, and they can even set up the call with the vendor with Vital Engaged. And, and we hope with um, some of the stakeholders also part of that conversation. So um, would you, the, the reason I'm asking the question is I'm trying to envision using the connectivity criteria in a certificate of need process because we have yes. done that uh, in the past yeah. uh, when it meets the criteria, obviously, the, the project. Yeah. So um, if you could, and you don't have to do this now, but if you could mm -hmm. also help us think through a little bit uh, the appropriate ways to use the connectivity criteria uh, when we are reviewing those large purchases. Yes, absolutely. That would be, um, I would love that, um, to be able to use it within the certificate of need. And I think later on in my presentation, I, I talk about, um, so when you're when you're doing that as your, um, as your role as the Green Mountain Care Board, I'm hoping that uh, the healthcare organizations are, are a step before that using the connectivity criteria, leveraging it with their um, with their vendor. So by the time they get in front of you, they know exactly where they stand. Um, and for those organizations, I believe we spoke about this last time that um, Mike and I were here, um, the, the number of vendor switches that are going on, organizations that are moving from one electronic health record to another um, for very good reasons. It could be that that it's just not supporting their documentation needs, their reporting needs. It could also be due to cost. We want to make sure that they use this connectivity criteria at the time that they're selecting or, or even beginning to identify what will their selection process be um, to move to an electronic health record so that they don't spend money, s begin the switch, and then find out that they're only able to hit tier one. That wouldn't do anyone any good. Right? Thank you. You're welcome. Just to follow up, to the sure. extent that there's a, there are small providers that don't have access to some of these large, don't have the resources to buy some of these larger packages, yeah. um, and they can only hit tier one, it sounds like the suggestion is to put some of the onus on their negotiations with the vendors. Does Vital have workarounds? You described this file extract. Are there workarounds for some of the smaller providers in the state that Maybe in their negotiations, they have no leverage with the vendor, a little leverage with the vendor, but Vital can step in and provide a workaround? Yeah, so, th mm -hmm. so that is one way that we were able to do this file extract, and um, and I do have to give um, kudos here to the Blueprint for Health. We worked very closely with them in order to find out they were getting a file extract, and so we wanted to leverage that type of a file extract. They're using it for their purpose, but we need to be able to use it, um, you know, for uh, an expanded use, and so how can we do that? And it's not a burden on the healthcare organization. Um, it's something that they're already doing. But we can we can think about how to how to get to connectivity criteria in a really creative way without spending a lot of money. I do expect that through the HIE steering committee that we will uncover more of that as we look at what the expanded or what the use cases are. 
and really start using the connectivity criteria and what comes out of some of this connectivity criteria assessment to determine where should we focus next. But I do believe that there are other creative ways to be able to get data um, and look forward to that. So I will move on. So these last two slides are um, more to just show you that we have been focused on this connectivity criteria, working with um, customers and stakeholders throughout the state to make sure that it, it really does support the core mission of the VHI, um, which Mike has stated, we're really focused on, on setting the, the foundation uh, right so that we can continue to think of what are advanced uses of data and advanced uses of the VHI, but let's make sure that we get our foundation right. So again, matching patients, being able to get a comprehensive set of data and driving towards data quality and holding those EHR vendors accountable. One, one last thing that I'll add about this is, um, again, being able to get to tier two, we wanna help healthcare organizations have that conversation. We want to support them if they switch vendors. Um, we've heard a few times that when organizations are trying to sign on the dotted line a contract with their vendor, they would like to have something written that they can say, this is what you need to meet, and if you don't, then you're, you are not meeting your contractual obligation. There needs to be service level agreements that you will actually meet this with in a certain time frame, and I believe that, that this connectivity criteria can help support that as well. And then lastly, supporting the HIE plan, which in Act 187, the connectivity criteria integrated into the HIE plan and really needs to support that. And um, Emily and Michael walked you through all of the goals that they're trying to achieve, and this just pretty much re reinforces that uh, with the you know added point of we really do want to help healthcare organizations and the state maximize the technology investment that they're making and identify what are the priorities. And again, more of that will be coming out of the HIE steering committee. And we hope that, again, the information that comes um, out of assessing organizations helps in setting that path forward to identify who should be connected and where should uh, we focus our efforts next. So, thank you. Questions thank you. Sarah, did you want to uh, say anything before we go to uh, public comments? Well, I have some preliminary staff recommendations to the board where I can walk us through the principles that I initially presented, but if you prefer to go to the public comments, that's fine as well. Which would you prefer? <laughs> Do you want preliminary staff recommendations? I think it's helpful for the public to hear preliminary staff recommendations okay. so that they can comment on that specifically. But I'll be speedy, I promise. Thank you, Christina. Thank, Thank you. Mike, I know you were there in 2006, too. <laughs> As was I. <laughs> the difference is, though, that Mike has gray hair now. I have no hair. <laughs> so I'll move us pretty quickly through this. Um, now that we've gotten a chance to hear from Diva and Vital, um, I thought it would be helpful to go back through the principles for review that I presented earlier in the meeting and say, um, you know, how, how do we think the HIE plan and connectivity criteria um, live up to those principles? So, there we go. Um, so there are a number of statutory requirements for the, um, for the HIT plan in section 9351, um, which is the, the statute that requires the administration to produce an HIT plan. Um, the statutory criteria include um, supporting effective, efficient statewide use of electronic health information, um, 
um, educating providers in the public, supporting interoperability, uh, proposing strategic investments in technology, uh, rec recommendations around funding mechanisms, um, incorporating existing initiatives and specifically mentioning the blueprint and MMIS. Um, as well as addressing issues related to governance and security. Um, at, as submitted, I do believe that the HIE plan um, meets these criteria, with the exception of proposing um, specific strategic um, technology investments. And as you heard from Diva, this is a, a particular choice that they made given the, the national kind of HIE m technology market environment. Um, as well as the, the spot that we're at with governance. So I think um, with that exception, the HIE plan meets this criteria well, and I think um, there's some significant benefit to us from holding off in that area. Um, the second criteria is around uh, alignment with the principles for healthcare reform in section 9371. Um, I think that uh, the HIE plan is broadly consistent with these principles. Um, I've named some here that I think it's particularly relevant to, and I'll just call out a few right now, um, in terms of supporting uh, system transparency, efficiency, and accountability. I think um, enabling the flow of clinical information to support these objectives by decreasing duplicative services through a longitudinal health record, for example, um, or by enabling measurement um, and evaluation, the second and third goals that Diva mentioned, I think that those would um, enhance our ability to achieve that principle. Um, principles four and eight focus on the central role of primary care in our healthcare system, as well as um, the, the importance of the relationship between individuals and their providers. I think that the HIE plan um, goals of longitudinal health records in particular um, and the HIE plan's discussion of consent policy really speak to that principle. Um, there are a number of others. I'll, I'll skip to the end and just say that I think one of the strongest elements of this plan is that it's a consensus document um, produced by a group of very knowledgeable people, um, you know, working across government, private organizations, um, who have all come together to, to develop a plan for the state that kind of um, provides a foundation for our work moving forward. So, principle number 13, the partnership between consumers, employers, healthcare providers, hospitals, and, and government. Um, that's one that I think is particularly important. Um, Third, I, I wanted to make sure that these principles were, um, were usable in the long term, so spoke about um, whether the HIE plan is, um, is consistent with other relevant legislation, but this year I think uh, it's important for us to focus on Act 187 of 2018, um, which required DEBA to, uh, to produce a work plan and to achieve a work plan um, related to uh, HIE um, oversight and, and it's worked with VITAL. Uh, and in particular, there's a section of that work plan that's specific to, um, to developing an HIE strategic plan. There are four activities in that section. Um, DIVA has met all of them as of November. Lastly, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that we thought about how, to what extent this plan incorporates the perspectives of, um, of Vermonters as well as incorporating national best practices and exemplars. Um, we heard from DIVA quite a bit about how the HIE plan um, incorporates and, and Vermontizes, I think was, um, was the word, some national models from the Office of the National Coordinator for HIT. Um, the steering committee also worked um, you'll see in the plan with um, with experts from Colorado, Michigan, and Oklahoma, which are, are all states that have um, particularly successful health information exchange programs. Um, and then in terms of seeking feedback from Vermonters, we also heard from DIVA um, about uh, the department's work outside of the steering committee to engage um, other stakeholder groups and, and incorporate their feedback into the plan. Um, so I, I think all of those speak well for the plan. Um, and then secondly, looking toward the connectivity criteria, there are um, two criteria that we developed um, to think about whether these would meet the state's needs. Um, the first is about alignment with the HIE plan and our state's health reform goals. Um, I believe that the connectivity criteria do that. Um, I think uh, Christina described very well how the connectivity criteria are kind of in alignment with how the HIE plan is thinking about uh, health information exchange in Vermont. Um, and then second, are the proposed connectivity criteria operationalizable? Um, 
I think we, we've heard quite a bit today about how these criteria um, could be put into practice through uh, enabling contracting with HIEHR vendors, excuse me, um, by helping practices and, and other healthcare organizations assess themselves um, and, and move up those tiers of connectivity. So I think um, to wrap it all up, um, my preliminary staff recommendations, um, you know, in, in advance of hearing public comment, would be um, that, that we approve the HIE plan um, and the connectivity criteria as submitted. Um, as we talked about earlier today, I'll be back on the 19th once the public comment period has ended, and after we've heard some public comment today, um, to report back to you on what we hear and give a final staff recommendation. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions, Sarah, before we go to the public? Okay, we'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Ken. Now, uh, I, I've had the opportunity to sort of follow this conversation on health information exchange since about 2005 or 2006. And different people have different lenses to look at the project. And I guess um, I, I would I would have to say that the word disconnect is the word that I would uh, categorize an awful lot of the work and language of the last 15, 17 years. It's a long time, um, including presentations before the Weemount Care Board by, by other staff. Um, and, and the disconnect, of, you know, the purpose and goals, I think, are laudatory. No, no one would absolutely argue against some of the purposes and goals. But I, I would just say that um, there's been a real disconnect between those goals and the application in the real world. And this is not a project that's been a stellar project. And I, I would have to say to the board, you know, um, at some point, um, I, would, I would kind of ask, what's your level of confidence after hearing this presentation that you really see a strong turnaround, particularly given the evaluation that was done eight or nine or 10 months ago that I was reviewing recently. And having said that, you know, the word disconnect is often, there's so much thrown here, you know, a lot of good work went into the presentation. I would just recommend that everybody read an article that's in the New Yorker uh, this week and I think it's titled something like, Why Doctors Hate Their Computers. And it sort of puts in what I call simple English language some of the comments that I heard or you know, hinted at. You know, that there were, in this article, one of the things that's expressed, which I thought you know, was instructive, because like everybody in the room, I'm a patient, as well as a consu you know, consumer and a policy advocate or consumer advocate. You know, the doctors are lamenting the fact that they don't have time to look at their portals where consumers and patients are just bombarding them with all kinds of questions and requests that it's become almost impossible to do. So it's sort of like, what happens when the real world hits in all these projects? So I guess my, my only comment or question is, could you identify one thing, perhaps other than Mike Smith, that gives you a high level of confidence that there's going to be a strong turnaround in what this project has been able to deliver for about $40 million. So I would point to a number of things, um, especially the work done by Michael Costa and his team assembling the stakeholders to try to, you know, focus the vision more. But I can tell you that in 2006, I was one of the people that took the bait, hook, line, and sinker that in five years we were going to be able to do some amazing things. So maybe I'm not the best guy to be answering your question. And I hope it's just not uh, hopeful optimism. I hope that um, there will be follow through. I, I do worry. Uh, as I pointed out, Mike has some gray hairs on his head, so he probably won't be there to see the full final uh, fruition of uh, vital if and when it grows up. And so that scares me. Um, I do think that at least 
the right questions have been asked, and a lot of that is due to the work that Michael and Emily have done. Um, following up on HTE, was it? HTS? Yeah. I'm not good with those. <laughs> Uh, other board members? I would, if I could just add, one of the things that gives me optimism is the changing of the contracts and the incentives and the deliverables. So I think to the extent that Diva has arranged different types of contracts with Vital that are performance-based, I think that changes things as well. So yep. add to that. Great point. The thing I would add is, as I said earlier, so much of the electronic medical record technology components are outside of the state's control. So I think the combination of the connectivity criteria, which focuses on usability and data quality with uh, sort of the vision and roadmap outlined by the HIT plan, uh, positions us well. With that said, if the technology itself doesn't improve, there's only so much, I think, the state can do about it. Um, if the EMRs continue to be basically built to be proprietary so they don't interconnect to make money for the technology companies. You know, there's nothing that state government or an organization such as Vital can, can do. I think they're, they're working on the right track to focus the resources that we do have and the work that we're doing as a state um, to be as successful as possible. But I, I also don't think we can hold them accountable for uh, technology company uh, lack of uh, success in really pulling this off. I would just add one other thing. Sorry, the opt out work that's yeah. going to happen yeah. in the legislative session, I think, is really key to the success of this. I think if we continue with an opt in policy, I have, I have doubts, but I think if we can move to opt out. There, there are five states that don't even um, have any policy, it's just assumed. Yeah, I was going to say uh, exactly what Jess said, um, and that's why I asked that question to Michael um, you know, when, when he was up front, is like, what happens if the legislature punts on this? And, um, and his answer I thought was appropriate, um, as I interpreted it, which was it's a business decision. If we don't have that foundational um, uh, component of this overall strategy in place, um, that has a huge effect in terms of, of the value of, of, of this to customers down the road. And it could be a difficult time where we have to say this thing just isn't going to happen. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, as you read the report, there's $100 million that's already gone into this over the years, as I understand it. Um, and, um, you know, from the federal government, from the state, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, and the, the possibility with a, a, you know, some extra millions of getting to a point where we achieve what Emily, um, what Sarah was talking about in terms of efficiencies in the system and things that make the system more affordable, we should be able to see that in our rate setting process and in our hospital budgeting process. Um, um, I believe these efficiencies are potentially real um, and they will manifest themselves um, at some point. I, I am curious as to how we might measure that as we go along to get kind of true insight into it. But um, I think, as Jess said, as we go along, there are some major benchmarks, and one of them is consent. And absent consent, um, the resolution of that issue, then uh, I think the, the rest of the plan might be in jeopardy. It is unfortunate that so much money has been sent, spent. We're only to this point. And part of that, I think, uh, whenever you have 90-10 federal match to, to state dollars that enough questions aren't asked. But that's just an aside. Are there other, is there other public comment and questions? Walter. Kevin's mentioned the year 2006 a lot. And in 2006, I was fighting for my life against the disease killing me and the U.S. healthcare system in Vermont at the same time. And one of the problems I had one of the numerous problems I had with medical records and information. And as a patient, I remember one time at a hospital in Vermont that the hospital lost my medical records. And I had to go scour the hospital, the patient, and I found them in a drawer. 
And another time, the hospital didn't send the records down. And I had to drive up 40 miles. I was all yellow to get them and bring them back. So I'm in favor of the medical records and you know the health and, and the electronic, because all of that could have been saved if it had been in place then. I'm trying to, I'm struggling to figure out why something so simple is so complex that we have, you know, two hours of presentations here on everything that, to me, you know, I hear doctors complain about it all the time, you know, they're fumbling with their computers and, oh, this didn't work, this doesn't connect with that. You know, I go in for a physical or something, oh, you had these, oh, damn it, I can't get these records up. I hear that all the time on the front lines. So I'm just wondering if there is a way to make this simple so that we all could understand it and utilize it rather than have this hugely complicated umbrella of steering committees and all the rest of it. Well, that's what their mission is, is to try to figure this out. You know, it's just <laughs> I, I wish that there was one person we could call up and say, straighten this out immediately. But that hasn't happened in, in technology. And, you know, take a look around us. Look at what happened with the exchange. I mean, that sounded so simple. It sounded like it should be just like Expedia, right? Well, I knew the exchanges were going to be a flop. I mean, this, it was, you know, the, the whole thing was crazy at the beginning. But, um, <clears throat> and they were a flop nationwide, not just here. But that's just to me, just speaking as a patient and as someone who has been up against what the system could do without the medical records. You know, I've had doctors forgot that I they even had an appointment with me and I had to go find them. No, well, that's exactly why this path was uh, started back then, was so that. Yeah. A Vermonter could go in anywhere in the state, mm -hmm. a medical provider could access their records, make sure that they're not doing something that's already been done, make sure that they're not being given a medicine that's contraindicative, things like that. And I think that we all share your frustration, Walter, that here we are all these years later and we're not there, but I, I think we have to continue to try to provide the tools to make us get to that ultimate uh, point where it's actually a success because quite frankly I don't see any revolutionary improvements in, uh, in uh, the quality of care or the cost of care without uh, a good flow of information all the I'm, way around. I'm with you there. You yep. know, I'm right beside you on that one. And I, I wish I had the technical expertise to be more out to the people across the room for me and you know this is one of those times where you really feel like you're lacking in your ability and it reminds me of back in 2006 Jim Letty looking at me and saying I'm putting you in charge of the technology piece because nobody else understands it and I'm like well hello do you think I do <laughs> so um, you know that there's been so much money spent the state hired uh, some of the best experts in the country when it comes to uh, IT and we still haven't been successful so um, I've got to tell you though I'm more optimistic today than I have been in the last 10 years so you can hope is there other questions or comments yes Georgia you got to yell. <laughs> um, so I'm Georgia Maharis from Bi-State Primary Care Association. Um, I think I just want to echo your last comment um, in that we at Bi-State who, like others in the room, have been on this same technology conversation um, for quite a long time. And I feel like what we consistently hear out of our members is, are there guardrails? Are there guidelines? Are there rules of the road? Um, because they don't, like, a doctor doesn't know which side is up of an EMR. So, um, in particular, this plan, I think, resets us on a better path that's more forward, um, more forward thinking, more flexible, 
and in particular acknowledges that no one entity within Vermont's healthcare system can control a piece, but if you bring all of those bright minds together, you can have a shot at trying to have a coordinated effort. Um, and in particular, our providers are, um, as was referenced earlier, those that don't have a lot of uh, additional resources to expand on giant technology. And we have three in this year alone who, well, over the past 12 months, who are in process of migrating to new systems. And it pulls their entire world offline for six to nine months. So um, we really appreciate the thoughtfulness of this, uh, as I say, plan for a plan, um, and then the setting up of a new process starting in 2019. Thank you, Georgia. Is there any other public comment or questions? Okay. Is there any old business to come before the board? No. Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.